This is KGW News at 11. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm Galen Etlin. We begin with an update. Businesses are cleaning up and regrouping after fire destroyed part of downtown Hillsborough last week. And one is the Hillsborough Pharmacy and Fountain in business since 1873. Now, with the help of volunteers, it is moving to a temporary new location, and our Art Edwards joins us here, and people can keep helping out Art. Oh, that's right, Galen. You know what? They can help clean up uh, the old business where uh, it has been damaged by the water and smoke, and then they can help set up at the temporary location as well. Fire roared through a section of downtown Hillsboro early on the morning of January 2nd, devastating several businesses. The Hillsboro Pharmacy and Fountain was mostly saved from the flames. We got the building, so we're pretty lucky. But there's extensive water damage. We're not going to be to work on Monday in this location. Kathy Smittlecoffer is the manager at the business. She's worked here for 37 years. Right now, the focus is to get things cleaned up and the pharmacy open in a temporary location. They're getting the job done with the help of people in the Hillsborough community. It's amazing what we've gotten done with just volunteers and people saying, what can I do to help? There's been a couple that have been like, you know, <laughs> Eight hour days in here, just, you know, yeah. it's been awesome. So we're pretty blessed. Jasmine Wynn is right in the middle of it all. She bought the Hillsboro Pharmacy and Fountain several months ago. To have this happen is devastating, but she says the response from the community is amazing. Um, I'm really surprised because I'm new here and everybody here supports us. And I love the community. I have to, because we've been serving vaccine and COVID-19 treatment and everything. And um, after we get back to our feet, we're going to try better to serve and pay back. For the short term, they'll be a couple of blocks away on Southeast Second Avenue. There's a sign inside the building and buckets of paint and other supplies waiting for volunteers to get to work. This is just a temporary home. We'll be back here. We'll be in here. It's going to be better. It's going to be new, but still have old employees like us, so <laughs> can't get rid of us. <laughs> so the goal is to have the pharmacy up and running at the temporary temporary location on Monday. In the meantime, Wynn has a couple of other pharmacies that she owns, and they are filling prescriptions for folks in Hillsboro, and then they deliver them to Hillsboro so people can still get their medications. Galen? So good to hear this update and that they're able to find some temporary solutions. Art, thank you very much. Well, clergy teachers, health care workers and protesters are raising voices to support city of Portland workers as a potential trade strike looms. The District Council of Trade Unions has been working with the city on a new contract for its 1200 city employees in six unions. Last month it declared an impasse in that bargaining process and now workers could strike as early as this month and it would threaten the city's ability to provide some services to you. We absolutely have provided critical services to the city. We've continued to keep the city working throughout, uh, well, a worldwide pandemic. You know, whether that's clean water, sewer systems, transportation, all of the many things that we do, we've continued to do. And it's time for city council to realize the value of their workforce. So here's the deal with the numbers. The city is offering a 1.6% cost of living increase that would date back to the beginning of July last year. It's also offering a 5% cost of living raise that would begin July of this year. The union argues though those offers are not in line with national inflation, which increased by more than 6% over the last year. Lawmakers in Washington will convene Monday for the 2022 legislative session, and the pandemic will force many to stay home like last year. For anyone working at the Capitol during the 60-day session, testing, masking, and distancing rules will be in effect. In the House, only up to five vaccinated lawmakers will be allowed on the floor at any given time. In the Senate, 15 lawmaker lawmakers can be on the floor, and they do not have to provide vaccine status, but they do have to have a negative COVID test. All committee hearings will be remote. Meanwhile, Governor Jay Inslee announced a new executive order to boost diversity in the state government. The governor plans to roll back a long-standing directive restricting affirmative action in state hiring, contracting, and education. An original ban on affirmative action was passed by former Governor Gary Locke in 1998. Inslee's executive order aims to increase the number of certified women, minority, and veteran-owned businesses in the state's master contracts. 
Well, you may have seen the video. OSU's research stadium is no more. It is a pile of rubble and crews imploded it ahead of a redevelopment project. But now that demolition site and all of that rubble is being repurposed. Our Christelle Kumway shows how search and rescue teams are now using it for training. Friday, we watched as part of Oregon history came down with a bang. The 67-year-old grandstand at Reeser Stadium was demolished to make room for new campus development. What was an iconic part of the Beavers game day experience is now a pile of rubble and twisted steel. The pile is also a unique opportunity for this canine search and rescue disaster training. To be able to train on a site like this can prepare us for an actual disaster that might happen at any time. Dog trainer Ann Wickman gathered dozens of handlers and their canine partners for the occasion. These people are operational search teams that go on searches for dementia patients that are lost and mushroom hunters that are lost. The canines trained to find survivors in disaster type situations. We just had one of our members go and hide. Letting their senses lead the way. Both for the live dogs and the human remains dogs to be able to use their noses and locate source, whether it be live or HRD, is just really unique. And it was just really good for the handlers. Many of these handlers have not been exposed to disaster training, so they, they also learned a lot, I hope. You did a lot, Sarah. So she and I kind of specialize on doing things in the woods. It's the closest we've ever done to a real disaster. Um, it gives us a lot of little things to think about and work on. Um, the amount of like sheet metal screws that you see once you're out there in the broken glass, it's just not something that I thought about when we were getting ready for this training. For Bonnie and Sarah and the other trainers, Trainees, working through the rubble and concrete, strengthened skills, and the bond between canine and handler. I love working with the dogs because they have so many senses that we don't have, and they're willing to share those with us and partner with us. And so it's really um, an honor. Cool use of that site before it gets cleared away. That was Christelle Kumway reporting for us. Now, today was just one of the trainings, and a night search was also held earlier tonight in the woods.